I'm so excited that uh, Professor Dan Slater is here. Uh, he is um, a remarkable political scientist uh, who studies emerging democracies. He's an expert uh, on Southeast Asia, a lot of uh, particular experience in Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, and he specializes in uh, the politics of dictatorship uh, and uh, democracy. Uh, he has spent most of his academic career at the University of Chicago, um, but is currently um, the James Oren Murfin Professor of Political Science uh, at the University of Michigan, as well as the Ronald and Eileen Weiser Professor of Emerging Democracies there. Uh, notably, uh, he spends much of his time uh, as the director of an important research center at the University of Michigan, the Weiser Center uh, for Emerging Democracies. Um, as many of you know from some of our previous uh, talks this semester, democracy is not at its most healthy uh, in the world. Uh, in fact, we've seen uh, some significant challenges uh, with decline of democratic participation uh, uh, over the past decade or, or so. Uh, and so as we think today uh, about uh, democracy, uh, we do so in the context in which democracy is, is largely under threat, but uh, Asia provides us with some remarkable variation. And so if you're a social scientist, you, we're always on the lookout for variation and trying to understand why do some countries that otherwise look like uh, each other uh, have different trajectories. Um, and uh, trajectories that dramatically affect the uh, the rights and the prosperity of the people um, that live in those countries. Um, importantly, and I don't want to forget this, um, Professor Slater is the father of Kai Slater, who uh, has a band called Lifeguard. Uh, and we encourage you to all check out Lifeguard. Um, they, they just performed at South by Southwest. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dan Slater to BYU. Thank you, Quinn. And if anybody wants to, to leave and go listen to, to Lifeguard on, on Spotify, I'll totally understand that it's a much, much cooler kid than his father, that's for sure. So those of you who are academic geeks, there is hope that your, your children will be cool at least, even if, uh, e even if we aren't. Um, well, thanks, Quinn, for the introduction and for the, the invitation. Uh, thanks, Darren Self, also for helping to, to arrange this from the political science department. Thanks, everybody, for coming out uh, in, these, in these conditions, uh, although I guess it's, it might not be so abnormal, but it's abnormal for me, even from Michigan. Uh, but it's really, really delightful to be here to talk about this, this new book, uh, which was written with Joseph Wong. Uh, and which uh, was released in September with Princeton University Press. And as you see, it's called From Development to Democracy. And those of you, you know, who study political science might be aware that kind of one of the most indestructible correlations in the world uh, is the, the correlation between levels of economic development and democracy. So no matter what statistical tricks you use, you cannot make go away the fact that economic and development excuse me, economic development and democracy do tend to go hand in hand. Now, that being said, we know that economic development does not always lead to democracy. We also know that democracy can arise in the absence of economic development. And our book does not challenge either of those conventional wisdoms and well-established points. But what we do try to do is think about how this truly spectacular <coughs> record of economic development in Northeast and Southeast Asia uh, has given rise to a, an uneven, and as I will stress, a clustered pattern of democratization and authoritarianism in uh, this part of the world. And I want to try to do so um, by introducing a, a different theory, a different way of thinking about democracy and how it comes about, which, to, to Professor Meekham's point, uh, I think um, could potentially give us some sense of optimism, um, some sense of at least of possibility, and that maybe uh, democracy is, can come about in an unlikely way that we don't tend to, to think about. Um, so hopefully at least a little bit of a, an antidote or a little bit of medicine, if you will, um, for our moment of, of democratic malaise. Okay, so let me give you a brief overview of the book. There's the, there's the cover. So um, a lot of people, I, I, I think a lot of people have trouble with, with the content, but people seem to like the cover. So I hope you like the cover of the book. Um, so to give you a basic overview, the setting of the book uh, we call Developmental Asia. 
uh, 12 cases linking Northeast and Southeast Asia, which we divide into four distinct clusters. Um, so we, we, those of you interested in Asia, we do try to rethink Asian geography in this book. Uh, the puzzle that we're addressing is that this region has had a tremendous amount of economic development, but much less democratization than we would expect given how much economic development that we, that we see. Uh, the approach we take in the book uh, is to examine developmental Asia's uneven and clustered democratization experience from a historical perspective. I encourage everybody here to approach their questions from a historical perspective. If that's the only thing you take away from today. Please do study history. It's really, really very, very important. Um, and the main argument we make in the book is that in developmental Asia, the primary mode of democratization has been what we call democracy through strength. And in fact, up until the very last moment, and for the decade we worked on this book, the title was always democracy through strength. So it's really kind of an important part of the, uh, of the book to us is that, that and that's sort of the, the core theoretical argument, that democracy can arise either because an authoritarian regime is weak or it can arise because an authoritarian regime is strong and it can use that strength to bring about democracy. Okay. So let me start with a, hopefully a motivating uh, example here of what democracy looks like through weakness as opposed to through strength. And what we have here is two images of uh, new presidents taking the oath of office. Uh, on the left, very, very small, both in real life and in the picture, I can't even hit her with a laser, she's so small, Corazon Aquino, right here. And what has just happened in 1986 in the Philippines is the people power revolution. It's the first time the term people power was, was ever used. So we're here, we're talking about civil society. So an ultimate example of civil society prevailing was in February 1986. There was a, an enormous democratic revolution. Hundreds of thousands of, of people in the Philippines came out into the streets to, to topple the regime of, uh, of Ferdinand Marcos uh, and did so successfully. As you see, Marcos fleed. He, he and his wife fled to, to Hawaii. Um, and you see it's a bit of a chaotic scene because this is all happening uh, impromptu. You know, there were elections that had been held a few weeks before, which the Marcos regime very brazenly stole, but they got busted in the act. So uh, what we have here is the, the result of a democratic revolution. And so democracy arises in the Philippines in 1986 through weakness, through the authoritarian regime's weakness. The Marcos regime has collapsed in 1986. Okay. We have a very different image on the right, uh, but only... Two years later, almost to the day, what we have is a picture from North Korea where No tae is assuming the oath of office uh, himself. And uh, if you had taken a picture of uh, new President No just a couple of years before, he would have been wearing a military uniform rather than uh, such a nice uh, snappy suit. And so what's happened in South Korea is the military-dominated regime decided uh, in the run-up to, the, to the, the Seoul Olympics in 1988 to open up the political process, to release political prisoners, to allow press freedom, to let civil society you know, actually protest and, and gather, to, you know, and to allow a free and fair electoral contest. And in that free and fair electoral contest, the old guard of the old ruling party, the old military elites, prevailed in the election. They won a free and fair election, and therefore he stays in office, uh, as chief executive, but in a new guise. He's no longer a military-backed dictator. He is the popularly elected president of South Korea. And now, I'm sure for a lot of us, especially those of us attending a session on civil society, might sort of temperamentally feel like, well, what happened on the left, that's democratization, right? The people rose, the people toppled the autocrat, they sent him into a disgraced exile, they've overturned the regime, like, this is democratization. This, on the right, I don't know what that is. That's, maybe it's liberalization, or it's just, it's old wine and new bottles. It's, it's, it's basically, I don't know, it's like regime washing itself or something like that. You know, this is not, this is not real democratization. Um, but if you fast forward 35 years, um, I don't think anybody would say that democracy in the Philippines is more functional than democracy in South Korea. In fact, you might know that in the Philippines that we have a, we have a new Ferdinand Marcos as president of the Philippines presently, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., who has just been elected uh, in the Philippines. And South Korea uh, is one of the most stable, substantive, solid, not backsliding democracies in the world. So again, as Professor Meekum noted, there's all this democratic malaise and pessimism but where our book kind of starts off from is saying that you know, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, these are three of the most impressive democracies in the world, and they tend not to get a lot of attention. 
Uh, I think if you open your whatever app you, you use to read news and you get Asian political news, my guess is you're going to get a lot more on China than you're going to get on Japan or South Korea or Taiwan or Indonesia for that matter. Um, and so trying to correct the picture, give us a fuller global picture of democracy in the world requires that we recognize that d democracy is not just Western, democracy is Eastern. Um, and some of the strongest democracies we have are Eastern democracies. Okay, so let me just give you a brief overview of the book and table of contents. So what we do in the first chapter is introduce our theory of democracy through strength. So why would this happen? Why would you actually get an outcome like this in South Korea? Uh, the second chapter then talks about the region and why thinking of Asia in terms of cardinal directions, East Asia, South Asia, and North Asia, you know, you, you name your, your cardinal directional Asia, just doesn't work for our purposes. Uh, and that developmental Asia is, a, is an identifiable world region that emerged in the wake of the Meiji Restoration in Japan and led to this tremendous upsurge of economic development uh, throughout the region, which is historically unprecedented. And then what we do, the next three chapters, in like, in, in, in Joseph Wong, my co-author, is primarily responsible for these chapters. Here we try to lay out these three examples of how these incredibly substantive and effective uh, successful democracies have come about. Uh, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. And in all three cases, we're going to argue, it happens because moderate, conservative civilian politicians were confident that if they held elections, they could win those elections, and that radical alternatives would not prevail, and that stability could be maintained under democratic conditions. Okay? Uh, but they're, they're all very, very different stories and different narratives. So um, we really try to do um, justice to these, these diverse political histories. Then what we do in chapter six is we, we tackle the case of China up to 1989. We split the China uh, part of the book into two parts. We address it both in chapter six and in chapter nine when we talk about the post-1989 period. Okay? And what we want to do is sort of rethink why China did not democratize in 1989. You might be aware that in June 1989, there was an enormous crackdown uh, in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. And the student-led movement, people your age, uh, out in the, the streets of, of Beijing and over much of China, uh, and there was a, a brutal, violent crackdown that killed many students in particular. And the usual understanding, so in a way, almost the same time as what happened in the Philippines, but it ends in a, crack, in a, in a crackdown rather than a democratic breakthrough. And the usual account that we have of this is, well, so China was a communist regime that didn't collapse because it was stronger than other communist regimes. So the Soviet Union and Poland and Czechoslovakia, and these were weaker regimes, therefore they collapsed. But China and the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, had some source of strength which allowed it to survive, and so it didn't collapse. So we don't disagree, that is true, but from another perspective, it's if we compare China not to its distant communist uh, partners, but to its neighboring countries, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, which have experienced decades of, of dramatic economic growth and institution building uh, in Northeast Asia, and were able to concede democracy and thrive from that context, you could also think of China in 1989 as too weak to concede. Okay? So the CCP was not confident that if they were to open up the system a la South Korea and hold elections, that they could have continued to win elections. They were worried they would get swept into the dustbin of history if they opened up the political process. Okay? So there, it, it's both the case that China was too weak to collapse, but also too, excuse me, too strong to collapse, but also too weak to concede. And because democracy can arise either through the collapse or the concession of the authoritarian regime, it's important to think about what the regime's weaknesses were as well and why it made it not confident in its future. Okay? What we then do is we divide up the region into three developmental clusters. I'll say more about clusters momentarily. What we call the developmental militarist cluster of Indonesia, Thailand, and Myanmar, developmental Britannia cluster of, uh, of Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong, the developmental socialist cluster, China, Vietnam, Cambodia. And then we conclude with thoughts on the universality of democracy, but also why democracy is so vulnerable around the world today um, and what our book implies for that. So let me just give you some takeaway lines from the case chapters. Hopefully this will motivate you to buy the book, not say, okay, now I know it's in the book. Um, but I'll get it from the library. Libraries are great. So here's some of the, the key points we make about these, these cases. So let me start with the, the four case chapters. So Japan, we say, is that while Japan was itself was horribly weakened in absolute terms, we're talking about World War II here, Japan's defeat, the relative strength of civilian conservatives was dramatically heightened by the abolition of Japan's military and the diminution of the Japanese emperor after the war. Okay. So the argument in Japan is World War II mattered very much, but not so much because America simply planted democracy there, as people tend to think, 
um, but because Japan self-grew its democracy and that those, those um, civilian politicians and bureaucrats who had tried to bring about democracy in the interwar period but had been sort of outpunched and out, out muscled by the military and by the monarchy, that when the war destroys the military and reduces the role of the monarchy, it allows the, these long developing civilian conservative politicians to then actually take over the political system, form the Liberal Democratic Party, and the LDP is still the ruling party of Japan to this, to this day. It's been a democracy since the, since the early 50s. Uh, Taiwan is actually in some ways a, a clearer case for our, our, our theory, a better example. Because um, whereas the, the pre-war conservative elite in Japan had an opportunity to rise from the rubble and ashes of World War II, the Kuomintang, or KMT, in Taiwan initiated democratic reform from an enduringly strong position. So the KMT is kind of our, 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 like our paradigmatic example of a case where they didn't democratize because they had to, they democratized because they saw it as a strategic move. I'll say more about why. South Korea is a, is a, is a weaker case, but still a, a case that fits the theory. So there, incumbent leaders, like No Tae they gambled. They calculated that the regime retained enough power, if not preponderant power, as well as enough legitimacy born of its remarkable record of developmental success to survive a democratic transition and potentially even to thrive in democracy. And one point I'll stress about South Korea, but a more general point, you might be sort of dubious about all this and think, well, wait, if you're a strong autocrat, why would you ever democratize? Like, you, you have, you're, you're fine. Like, why would you do this voluntarily? And one reason that you do it is because the opposition to, to autocracies, excuse me, to autocracies tends to be very unified. So a very diverse set of civil society groups can come together in opposition because they all hate the dictator. But when the dictator says, I'm going to stop repressing you, then all the things that make civil society disagree come to the fore. You're from different regions. You're from different religious backgrounds. You speak different languages. You come from, uh, you, you have different views on economic policy. And so democracy allows you to actually to, to divide your opponents um, in a way that, that is, should be attractive if you're a leader who can see the possibility of staying in power democratically. And then in China, as I suggested, from our perspective, the CCP avoided democratic transition in the summer of 1989, not only because it was too strong to collapse, but also because it was too weak to concede democracy through strength. It lacked the confidence that it could concede democracy and thrive, as seen in our previous three chapters on Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. So then from here, we go to then the three, the three clusters of cases. Let me give you kind of the broad brushstrokes of our arguments in those chapters. So in the developmental militarist cluster, so we say that Indonesia has enjoyed more democratic su success than either Myanmar or Thailand since the turn of the millennium because of the inherited strength of party and state institutions built up during Suharto's authoritarian new order during the previous millennium. So Indonesia was a, basically a military regime from 1966 to 98. And although the military dominated, they did build a stronger uh, ruling party, which has become very vital in, uh, in the survival of democracy. Uh, and also a much stronger state apparatus. Um, develop, in developmental Britannia, so Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, the general pattern has been democracy avoidance, not democracy through strength. The disastrous cost of delay for political stability and for the authoritarian incumbents themselves are most obvious in Malaysia and Hong Kong, while Singapore's authoritarian order remains in much stronger shape. So the argument we make is that in Malaysia and Hong Kong, at, a prior, at prior moments in time, the authoritarian regime was popular enough and strong enough that it could have conceded democratic reforms and won, continued to win elections, a la South Korea, a la Taiwan, a la Japan, but they missed the opportunity to do so. In Malaysia now, the old uh, ruling party has been voted out of office. Hong Kong has descended into ungovernability because of so much civil society anger at the failure of the Beijing-backed government in Hong Kong to, to actually fulfill uh, any kind of democratic reforms. So this is another reason why, if you're thinking, why would a dictator do this? It's because if you're strong now, you might not be strong tomorrow. It makes more sense to reform when you're still in a strong position than to, to wait till things start going downhill. And finally, the developmental socialist cluster. We argue that by the 2010s, all three developmental socialist cases, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, had become viable candidates to pursue democracy through strength, with China the strongest of all. Yet, as in the developmental Britannia cluster, none have done so. Um, and this is not strictly a matter of sort of modernization theory and of just economic development itself, because if the developmental militarist cluster was not too underdeveloped to experiment with democratic reforms, neither is the developmental socialist cluster. So hopefully you're getting a picture by now that there's a lot of variation in democracy in the region, which, which, uh, uh, which kind of accords with these different clusters. Let me say a little more about the region. So these are Northeast and Southeast Asian polities that have followed a state-sponsored export-led strategy of rapid economic growth and catch up with the richest countries in the world, particularly in the West, and they've done so with widely varying degrees of commitment and success. So the 12 cases we're capturing here 
illustrate a real spectrum of success, a real spectrum of, uh, of strength. Okay, so they're not all identical by any stretch of the imagination. This region is shaped politically, not just geographically. So countries like the Philippines, North Korea, Laos, Brunei, Mongolia, they're all in East Asia or Southeast Asia, but they did not join developmental Asia because they did not start following the kinds of policies that started in Meiji Japan in the 19th century and have spread across the region and led to this really remarkable uh, you know, historical regional uh, shift in economic growth in which one of the world's poorest regions has become one of the world's richest regions. Um, this is a zone of shifting and overlapping American, British, Japanese, and Chinese regime influence. It is not predominantly a Sinocentric region. Again, I think this is one of the most important lessons of the book. Uh, don't look at Asia and think China is the center of it all and China dominates its neighbors. China does not dominate its neighbors. Um, and in fact, China, when we think of the region as developmental Asia, you realize that China is not the leader of developmental Asia. China is a latecomer to developmental Asia. It is a laggard in developmental Asia. China began pursuing these kinds of economic reforms long after most of the other countries in the region did. So it's really still catching up, even with its neighbors. Um, so it's a region with four identifiable clusters of distinctive types of developmentalism, which profoundly shape regime variation. So just to be explicit on this, the four clusters, um, color-coded, uh, the, the developmental status cluster, uh, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, the developmental socialist cluster, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, developmental Britannia, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and developmental militarism, Indonesia, Thailand, and Myanmar. So that's the context, that's the setting. Let me talk a little bit more about the, the theory. So how exactly is democracy through weakness different from democracy through strength? And basically the theory, if you've taken democratization classes, uh, my bet is that the theories you've read explain a lot more about the weakness scenario than the strength scenario. So we're trying to say it can happen in another way. So what are the differences? Well, in the weakness scenario, what's really weak is the institutions. So the, the ruling party is weak, or there's not a ruling party. There's a personalist dictator who doesn't really rule in any regular, um, regular kind of predictable way. Um, institutions are weak. Regime collapses. Rulers are deeply divided. The argument is, you know, these regimes, they only, authoritarian regimes will only democratize when they've become deeply, deeply split. That's actually not true. Uh, in East Asia, they uh, do so when they're more united. We think it happens as a last resort. So again, the autocrat flees because they have no other choice at this point. The regime is, is, is collapsing. We think these things tend to be negotiated exits from power. So what the dictators do is they sit down with people in the opposition they can talk to, and they come to some kind of agreement on, okay, like, I'll leave office, but you have to promise not to prosecute me and not, you know, take all my ill-begotten gains away, and you have to give my children safety, and, and then I'll get out of the way. But we're going to negotiate this, the, the regime and its opponents. You concede defeat. I'm the dictator. I concede defeat. I've lost. I'm gone. Um, we often think this is an example of, this happens because dictators are bungling. They have bad information, they're misinformed, they think they're more popular than they really are, and so they wind up, so democracy rises through these mistakes. Um, probably the most important book on democracy written in recent decades by um, Duran Asamoglu and uh, James Robinson argues that the threat of revolution is what brings democracy about. Okay. So again, the only reason a dictator would give up power and leave office is because they fear they're going to go down in some violent uh, revolutionary fashion if they don't. Okay. Um, the legitimacy of the dictatorship gets relinquished in the process. That They're discredited. They're disgraced. It happens very suddenly. You've, you've opened up your app. You're like, wait, there's huge street protests in some capital of a country I've barely heard of. And a few days later, the, the dictator has fallen. Like, where did this come from? And there's a lot of elite upheaval. So people who were, were in the regime get thrown into the opposition. People in the opposition become the regime. This is basically the kind of canonical, most common way we understand how democracy comes about. Okay? In the democracy through strength scenario, all of these things are different. The institutions are not weak, they are strong. There's a strong ruling party. There is a strong state apparatus. The military is cohesive and unified. They, they're willing to defend the regime. This is not a regime that's, that's falling apart. The rulers are, are, are united. They're not, they're not becoming fragmented and disagreeing, and this is not what they do in, in exiting office. They come up with a strategy, and they agree in a cohesive, consistent way to move toward democracy. It's proactive. Again, it doesn't have to, they don't have to wait for the opposition to do anything. They can do this on their own terms, on their own timing, when they want. Um, and they do so unilaterally. It's not negotiated. This is not something where the, the regime sits down with its opponent and says, OK, what should the rules be? No, they say, this is what the rules are going to be. And they, for it to be democracy, it has to include things like a level playing field between the government and its opposition, free and fair elections, again, free speech, civil society protections, these kinds of things. But it, this can be done unilaterally. 
Uh, they concede democracy. They do not concede defeat. Okay? So again, the idea here is we come in democracy because we've opened up the process. We're not using repression. We're having these free and fair elections. That's what makes you a democracy. You don't have to lose for it to be a democracy. Okay? Anybody can win in a democracy. Okay? So you concede democracy without conceding defeat. This is not examples of dictators bungling, but experimenting. Okay? So the idea is what they'll do, they feel strong, they feel confident, so they embark on these reforms, but they could always reverse it. They could pull the plug if it goes badly. Okay? These are not, um, dictators are not omniscient. This is not intelligent design. This is not some grand blueprint. Politics is politics. There are always surprises. And so there can be a, a, a pulling back from the experiment. Probably the biggest corrective we offer, I think, is that it's not the threat of revolution, but the opposite. It's your expectation of stability that gets you to do these reforms. Okay? If you're threatened with a revolutionary overthrow, you're probably not very inclined to liberalize things and open things up you know, when people are like, trying to kill you. right? You're more likely to crack down. And what we find over and over again in Asia, and I think in other parts of the world, is when there's a real threat of revolution, this is when regimes get really, really nasty and very, very vicious and brutal. Um, so it's in not the threat of revolution, but their expectation that stability can be preserved after democratization that is the key. Legitimacy of the old regime doesn't get relinquished, it gets redefined. So as Note is up there taking the oath of office, he's saying something to the effect of, well, we've already brought you development, and now we bring you democracy. Right? So they're building on, they're leveraging their developmental track records um, to, to introduce democracy. This doesn't happen through a sudden collapse. It happens through sequential concessions. So the regime can, in a very gradual way, say we're going to loosen this up, loosen that up. So in a case like Taiwan, people, even those who know Taiwan best, will disagree and will argue vehemently about when did Taiwan become a democracy? Because it did so so sequentially, so gradually. It's like, which step is it that, that made the difference? And you get a, little, a lot of elite continuity, as captured in the Noteu photo, right? Uh, people who were in the old regime can stay in power. People who were opponents of the dictatorship, they're still opponents of the government, right? But now they're, they're opponents in a democratic context, not an authoritarian context. And again, those of you who are in democratization classes, here are some other works that we, that we reference and get us, I think, somewhat that suggested some of the things we're arguing. But basically, before our book, I think our theories have given us some reasons to say, OK, well, we agree that dictators may preemptively liberalize, but they won't go all the way to democracy or they might exit power entirely, I think we're the first people to say, no, no, they might actually democratize full force and not leave power. Okay. So again, just to take a, take a step back, when you hear in the media people talking about, well, will China ever democratize, right? that instantly becomes the question, will the CCP collapse? Will the regime will completely crumble? Right? And more than anything else, what I want to convey to you is those two are different things. That China can democratize without the CCP collapsing. The CCP does not have to collapse for China to become a democracy. And again, its most its neighbors, even its own rogue province of Taiwan, has done this, right? So this is this is very much this is the way that democracy tends to come about in developmental Asia in the first place. So um, as China gets stronger, it might be moving closer to democracy, not further from democracy. I don't think Xi Jinping is of that mindset, but, but thinking beyond the, the, the current leader. OK, let me try to move on here. So in the really the simplest way of thinking about what we're saying theoretically, so how does this happen is like this. So if, a, if an authoritarian regime for decades presides over economic development, it gives it a couple of things. One thing it gives it is a track record. Okay? So it's got this record of success. We are the ones who can, who can run the economy. We're the competent ones. And so with that track record, that should give you what you would call victory confidence. And victory confidence, hopefully this is very intuitive, it's just your confidence that you can prevail in democratic elections if they are held. You have victory confidence. You have a track record you can run on. And of course, your opponents who have been out of power, they've never run the economy. Also, economic development, um, you know, and particularly in the, the Asian model as it's worked, has led to really substantial poverty reduction. And when poverty is reduced, the middle class is bigger, um, the, the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest is, is narrowed, and that means that you're less likely to see like, really intense redistributive pressure or that the poor are going to try to expropriate the rich under democracy. So that gives what we call stability confidence, which is just, again, for this old authoritarian regime, are they confident that stability can be maintained if democracy comes about? So these are kind of the beating heart of the theory, and this is the thing to kind of look for, is do these regimes have victory confidence? Do they have stability confidence? That's necessary for democracy through strength to come about. But why does it happen, and when does it happen when it does? Um, and here we wrote an article about 10 years ago um, that introduced this, this theory of, of why they do. The book basically is going from that same theoretical idea. And we could talk more in Q&A if you're interested, but again, it's all in the book. 
essentially the idea is these strengths, these regimes build up strengths over decades, very over time, very, very slow moving, gradually build up these strengths. And then in a much more sudden way, they receive certain signals, uh, which can come from the economy. They can come from elections, um, like even authoritarian elections. They can come from uh, the geopolitical context. So if superpowers start acting differently, changing uh, their, their views, it can come from protests. So again, civil society is very important here. The strongest signal to an authoritarian regime that it needs to consider changing its stripes and its direction are these massive protests. Okay? So civil society is really vital. But at the end of the day, these are strong dictatorships. Nothing can make them democratize if they don't want to. And so it comes down to the strategies of these autocrats themselves and these regimes. And so you need to go, so strength is not enough. We're not saying if you're a strong authoritarian regime, you will do this, because most of them don't. But, but these signals and these strategies, when they change, that prevents, presents these openings for uh, democracy through strength to come about. So as I said, these all exist on a spectrum. Um, and you can kind of see, as we talk about the spectrum of strength and, and weakness, how the clusters come about. Because these, uh, the, the clusters really come about through the, the varying strengths that they have. So the six democratic or democratic concession cases that we have, Japan in the 50s, Taiwan in the 80s and 90s, South Korea in the 80s, you see that's our status cluster. Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar, that's the militarist cluster that did this in the 90s, the 80s in Thailand, uh, the 2010s in Myanmar. And then the six avoidance cases, which have never embarked on these kind of experiments, the Britannia cluster, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and the socialist cluster, China, Vietnam, and Cambodia. So basically what you can see here is these, these clusters of economic development. And what the book does, each empirical chapter devotes about half the chapter just to laying out the history of economic development and how it looks different, how it's organized differently uh, across these different clusters. And then what you see is, you know, kind of remarkably, these developmental clusters basically perfectly predict whether or not you're going to embark on these reforms or not. So the clustering really seems, seems to matter. So to think of it this way, okay, so one way to think about this is we have two clusters which are of quite high strength, okay, in, in the sense here that these are the wealthiest, they've got the strongest economic track records, they're the wealthiest countries in our group. Um, and have the strongest political institutions, political, orga political organizations that have arisen, right? And the lower six are of more intermediate strength. They are stronger regimes and more successful e economies than most authoritarian regimes in the world, but they're certainly not the equal of the, the, of the top six. So let's just pause and think, so what does this mean for, for our, our big theories, right? So modernization theory. This idea is countries get richer, they become more democratic, okay? Well, if, it were just, if, if Asia just supported modernization theory, then the top six would be the, the ones that have conceded democracy, right? It would be horizontal variation, but it's not. It's vertical. You go from Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar. They're all the ones that have pursued these democratic reforms from positions of strength at some time or another, right? So Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong look very bad for modernization theory. They have, they have the riches, but they didn't do the reforms, okay? So if you look at just Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, you say, well, those two clusters make sense given modernization theory. And maybe as China, Vietnam, Cambodia get richer, they'll become more like Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. But part of what the cluster analysis tells us is, you know, not so fast. Countries aren't just a GDP, right? They're also a kind of country. They have these distinctive sets of institutions. And so we've never seen this happen in the socialist cluster. We've never seen it happen in the Britannia cluster. And that suggests there's something about the, the again, the institutions, the histories, and the book tries to do justice to this, this complexity. Um, that has made them resistant to these kinds, of, these kinds of reforms. And the other thing I'll say is what we're capturing vertically here is, so the cluster itself is the best explanation for whether you do the reforms, whether you attempt them, but how high you are on the chart is your best predictor of how well it's going to go. Okay? So the fact that Indonesia's democracy has largely stabilized, Thailand and Myanmar's did not, you had coups that removed uh, democratically elected governments and brought the military back, it's explicable in our theory because they're the weakest cases. Okay? They're, the, they're where, the, again, these political parties that arose, they're, they're, they're the weakest, they have the least economic development they're building on. And so in that respect, too, um, one can say, if one is, is prone to believe modernization theory and this idea, you can find some support for it there, too. So we could talk about all of these cases in Q&A if you're interested, but I just want to um, move on to, to conclude. So, you might often hear that this part of the world is really, really anti-democratic, very authoritarian, um, Asian values, Confucian values. So these cultural accounts sort of say developmental Asia is uniquely ill-suited for democratization. Well, we're saying that if you think about the institutions and what it takes to be strong enough to do this, they're actually, this region is distinctly well-suited for democracy through strength because the way these, um, they've, they've grown for these decades. 
Um, I'd also note Asia's modal democratization pathway is more comparable to older European cases than to similarly young democracies. So Daniel Ziblatt's written a wonderful book about Europe and the role the conservative parties played in smoothing the, pro the, the path to democracy there. Also, I would really urge you um, to think about, think about how authoritarian regimes operate. There, it's, there's this tendency to think about them through a lens of what I would call collapsism, right? Like everything is, just, well, is it going to collapse? Is it not going to collapse? Like, oh, did the CCP collapse today? Oh, it didn't collapse today. Nothing happened, right? No, like there's really important things going on. And one thing is that these histories of these regimes, their institutions, their policies, their developmental records, they don't just shape whether or not they're going to survive or, or collapse. They also set the stage for what could be a stabilizing uh, concession process, democratization process or not. Um, also, I would stress that the, the, the democratic recession happening around the world today, uh, which Professor Mika mentioned, I think it largely hinges on a lack of confidence that democracy and stability can go together. Um, so if you don't think democracy will provide stability, you're probably not going to be very supportive of democracy. And that points to our last point, which is that we assert in our conclusion, democracy is in fact a universal value. It is not culturally bound. It is not, you know, uh, is not just bound to certain certain people. Everyone, people all around the world, I think, would like to be ruled in a democracy rather than an authoritarian regime, all else equal. But democracy is not the ultimate ends of politics. More importantly is, how is your family doing? Do, do you have peace? Do you have prosperity? And so the fact that democracy doesn't always deliver those things means that when democracy fails to provide those deeper needs of peace and prosperity, it will always be endangered and always be vulnerable. And the idea is that's not specific to the West, that's not specific to the East, that is specific to humanity and specific to just our condition and why democracy either thrives or doesn't, or doesn't thrive. Um, so I will stop there and uh, open it up for your questions. Thank you. Uh, incredibly interesting. Uh, so much uh, for us to discuss. Uh, we will go until 1 p.m. today. Uh, if you need to leave because you have a course commitment before that, you're welcome to do so. Um, but we will uh, move to discussion. If you have a question for Professor Slater, uh, just please raise your hand. Um, he'll call on you. We'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, when you receive the mic, please stand up uh, and tell us your name, uh, what you're studying, um, or a little bit about you. Um, and uh, we look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Um, so I'm Kimberly. I am studying psychology. Uh -huh. I'm just curious of of the places that you discussed, which democracy um, of these do you think functions most similarly to our traditional like U.S. democracy that we think of? It's mm. a good question. Um, I would say so of the the four consolidated democracies to the extent democracies consolidate, you know, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. Um, I guess I'd say Taiwan, South Korea are probably the most similar in the sense that. Um, you know, they're certainly closely tied to the United States. They're presidential systems. Um, they tend to have like a two-party system or at least a two-cleavage system. And you could, you know, I think at least loosely look at the parties in Taiwan and South Korea and kind of connect them or associate them with the Democrats and the, and the Republicans. Um, and, you know, in the, you know, South Korea, like now, like the United States, now has a, a history of prosecuting its former uh, former presidents. So, and uh, as does Taiwan, where uh, Chen Shui-bian spent some time in prison. So, um, it is possible to prosecute. It is possible to imprison former presidents, and it does not mean democracy will will die. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bernard Kanner, studying mechanical engineering. Hmm. Uh, my question is, um, so we actually had another lecturer who talked about Uruguay, a very similar case. Uh -huh. um, and my question is, I don't know if the examples show or how long, essentially how long do these regimes need to be in power mm. before, like th democratically, mm. before them losing that power will not simply result in a military coup, a military takeover. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wish there was a magic number, right? So political scientists have long said they, they talk about this thing called consolidation. And they say, well, if you've had two peaceful transfers of power, like, then you're safe. I don't think anyone believes that anymore, right? I think it's pretty clear democracies are never really entirely safe. Um, there's always the, the prospect of, of it being undermined in a variety of ways. Um, but, but I do think time matters, and I think that time... Uh, you know, some people say democracy is a stock variable in the sense that 
if you've had it for 50 years, it's a different thing than if you've had it for 10 years. You know, so it's not just how democratic you are, but how long you've been democratic. Um, and I do think that the, you know, those that have been the longest. I mean, Indonesia is certainly the, uh, you know, the, the most at risk of the of the four I was talking about, and it's also the the youngest of the four in terms of democracy. Um, you know, Myanmar. They, you know, one could argue they didn't even get to be all the way to be a democratic regime between 2011 and 2021. I think there's good debates about that. Um, but it was clearly very, 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 very new. Um, and so, yeah, I think in some ways the, you could also ask you know, the question of how long does an authoritarian regime have to build up strength before it's ready to kind of do this. And you know, Myanmar is, I think, the example of did, the one that did so the most uh, you know, early, and it ended up failing. I think we can talk more about why it failed. I don't think it had to fail. Um, but I think cases like Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar should give us some confidence that you don't have to be an extraordinarily strong and rude authoritarian regime to be able to do this. And I think other parts of the world have shown us that there are authoritarian regimes that have done this. There's great quantitative work by Michael Miller that shows that generally, you know, when, you know, after authoritarian regimes die, like old parties tend to win elections after from those old authoritarian periods, right? Um, so I think authoritarian regimes should have, in general, a lot more confidence that they can actually pursue democratic reforms that would solve a lot of problems without undermining their own positions too badly. I'm wondering how you think that the democracy through strength method of democratization mm. should affect U.S. policy best practices towards these types of states, mm -hmm. authoritarian regimes. Very, very good question. I think that the the main thing that I would say is that you know I think American democracy promotion tends to take the form of where some regimes close to the edge, you know, close to collapse, and how could we nudge them over the over the edge. Um, and I think that when, when authoritarian regimes collapse, and I'm not saying we should never encourage that or that it's not, never a, 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 a good thing uh, for a regime to collapse, but uh, often leads to pretty bad outcomes. Um, and so I think we should be looking for more democratic possibility in stronger authoritarian regimes. And again, not always thinking that, you know, if an authoritarian regime is doing things like if it's committed to economic growth, if it's committed to the well-being of its citizens, you know, and many authoritarian regimes are not, but some authoritarian regimes are. I think that we should be working with regimes that are, in fact, building up strong developmental track records um, and try to, you know, nudge them in a direction and give uh, these really concrete examples of why it's the case historically that, you know, you, you can loosen up the process and not, you know, suffer the, the instabilities and the kind of defeats that, that you fear. So I think part of it is that kind of encouragement and being willing to support regimes that are willing to go in those, in those directions. So there's a lot more places that are, you know, so we call candidate cases these ones that are the strongest ones, right? And so don't only think of candidates for democratization as dictatorships that are crumbling and falling apart. So for the uh, kind of dictatorships that end up like adopting like democracy, mm -hmm. do you find that even though they're like having a democracy that it's still, it's more likely for them to be like corrupt, I guess, mm -hmm. have a more corrupt governments, even though they are democracies and people can vote? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And there's, I think there's a good bit of, of disagreement like among those of us who, who study these things. I think that, that some people see that, that on average, if you have like an old authoritarian party hanging on, that th that causes certain debilities, certain weaknesses in, in democracy. Um, and from other, other people have looked at it and said, well, no, when you have these parties carry over, it actually gives more stability to, you know, it gives, it creates a party for other parties to compete against. And so it helps structure things in a, a way that, you know, is more, is kind of healthy for democracy. Um, I think in this, uh, you know, it's it's tough, you know. There are these different, you know, counterfactuals we ask, right? So if you look at a place like Indonesia, you can say, well, is it has it been better or worse for democracy that these old a lot of these old guard elites have held on? Um, I think certainly the way the military has held on and remained prominent is just a, a net bad for democracy, no question. Um, I think that the the holdover of at least some of these corrupt politicians, you know, to be sure. But the thing is, is we sort of these are these are societies that have a lot of corruption, and these are societies that have a lot of conservatives, right? And so I think that how you bring these you know conservative actors into you know support for democracy, and how you at least create some context for corruption to be limited. You know, I mean Indonesia, 
for all its you know very high levels of corruption for sure, but also has had one of the strongest anti-corruption agencies you know in the world um, in in recent decades, and that's very much a product of of democratization. So I think what you're asking is a really great open-ended question. I think we could look across the world, and I think the, the best political scientists could look at that question and answer it differently and focus on different things. So I think there's like a lot of research possibility in just thinking through. So when you get through weakness, you know, all of the Philippines, you get through strength, all of South Korea, what are the lasting implications of that? Um, there's actually, there's a, a new book by Ali Kadavar that argues when civil society pushes for democracy, you end up with a healthier democracy. That's kind of his quantitative result. Um, I'm sort of more of the viewpoint that these are all kind of averages. The point is that there is another way. Right. I think that what we really should be looking for is, is not just probabilities in politics, but possibilities. And when we see that there is another possible route to these good outcomes, we should be kind of embracing it and trying to think about, okay, so when and how can you make that come about? Back to, which kind of relates to the earlier question on democracy promotion, right? There are more, there are more positive pathways out there than we, we might appreciate. Good question. You're holding the mic. You can definitely ask a question. Power, so I can yes, ask it. Okay. Absolutely. This is sort of related to, I guess, one of your later claims, which is that, you know, democracy is sort of a universal value. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to spend uh, a bit of time over the summer in Morocco Fantastic. doing research with a couple of professors here. Mm -hmm. And I had a really interesting interaction with, like, our tour guide who was yep. sort of showing us all over the place, and his name was Mohammed. Mm -hmm. And we had like a 30 minute, probably longer conversation just about democracy. Uh -huh. um, Cause the way he thought about democracy was really different than the way that I thought about democracy. Uh -huh. You know, as you might expect. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, where, you know, he, he was telling me that like, you know, he and the people around him and the people he knows, they really care deeply about equality. They care deeply about, yeah. you know, community welfare. They're ke they care deeply about liberty. And like, it was interesting. Cause I was like, you care yeah. about the same things I care about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. but he was like, but I don't want democracy. Right. I don't want it. I don't trust it. I don't right. think it's good for me. Like, I, I disagree. Like, right. And in my mind, I was like, oh, like, right. You know, like, uh -huh. why? Like, yeah. why would you not? Because democracy can provide those things. And it was really uh, interesting, this disconnect. Yeah. So, yeah. To hear yeah. you talk about democracy as a value. Yeah. You know, I think that resonated a lot because he was expressing that, like, democracy yeah. as a value. Yeah. But how do you match up? democracy as a value yeah. with democracy as an institution. Yeah. And like, mm -hmm. those are those are different, and they're different in people's brains. So for sure, for what's sure. What's your perspective on that's that? Great, that's a great example. I love the, I love the narrative. I love the story. Um, well, so one thing I should say is that democracy is a universal value, but authoritarianism is also a universal value, right? That they're under very kind of common conditions. People all around the world will support authoritarianism under certain conditions, right? So it is these, it's, it's, Muhammad is thinking, if we have democracy, it's going to lead to all of these things. And that's what his, that's the, the, the inference he draws from looking at the world and looking at, you know, probably looking at, you know, the United States and seeing how things are reported and what have you. Um, so I'm not saying every single person in the world is like, want, is clamoring for democracy. That's clearly not the case. Um, but the idea is that, again, people I think would generally rather have all those things you're talking about, all else equal, as long as they don't lose all the other important things in the process, right? Um, and the other thing I would say is this idea that democracy, you know, comes in vernaculars, right? That different people around the world think differently about what democracy is. Like, we could have written a very different book, and I think it would have been an equally credible book if we said, you know what, forget this whole idea that political scientists have, that democracy is these things, right? And let's say, let's just actually just look at how local context people think about what democracy is. And you say, you know what, what we have in these four clusters is four different ways of thinking about democracy. And that in China, in China, they're convinced they have a democracy too because of responsiveness and substance and all these things. In America's not a democracy, we're a democracy. And places like Singapore and Malaysia and Hong Kong, people could say, well, we have these strong rule of law, you know, and rule of law is what really matters. And that's kind of the essence of democracy. And the elections are not as important, right? So you could tell a story in which, you know, all of these places are you know, in some sense democratic in a way that historically they haven't been, but they've moved towards different kinds of democracy. That would be a different way of thinking about it. I think that's a perfectly fair way of thinking about it. But for those who do political science and are very concerned about these questions of, you know, 
basically you don't like to see political prisoners. You want to see people, you know, you want to see that governments that are, you know, that, that govern poorly and abusively, you have a chance to remove them. Like those things do, I think, also matter. And political scientists, at least in the U.S., tend to be very focused on those things. And I think, I think rightly so. But it's not the whole thing. There's a lot more to democracy than just what goes into this, to this book. And we, we talk in the introduction about how, like, how much democracy really requires. But this is part of what it, you know, I tend to think it requires, you know, and so um, we're, we're not looking at all of the rights and all of the good things that we hope come with democracy. Um, we don't have theories of that in this book, um, but we, but I think we are theorizing a very important aspect of what it takes to bring about a, a place where someone like Muhammad could say whatever he wants on the street and he's not going to be thrown into prison for, for doing so. Because there are certainly things Morocco, that Muhammad cannot say on the street without getting thrown into prison in a place like Morocco. So. Um, my name is Natalie. I study international relations. I was just wondering, as I'm looking up at your clusters, I think there's one country in particular, at least that I'm, I study quite a lot about, that is not in there, and that's North Korea. And I was just wondering what huh? your thoughts are and how that fits into this yep. discussion around democratization. Yeah. So basically, if you look at the developmental socialist cluster, right, so after, like, you know, during the Cold War, the, the, the way you clustered Asia was, you know, capitalist Asia and communist Asia, you know, and you had these two waves of revolutions, you know, 40s and 50s, you had China and North Korea, and then by the 70s, you had Vietnam and Cambodia, right? So you had these waves of revolution, these, these, these four communist regimes, and as we say, you know, developmental Asia is a region you join, and you, you join it by basically setting aside, you know, communist economics to a large degree, embracing markets, trying to be export-led, trying to, again, rise this kind of just... There's basically, you can think of this, this rising economic tide going across Asia in which all you got to do if you're like a Cambodia or a Myanmar, it's not really that hard. Like the economic reforms you need to do to actually start growing really, really rapidly. I mean, Myanmar, I mean, Myanmar is without question the weakest economy in here, right? And Myanmar in some ways was more like the socialist cases during the Cold War. You know, it had a like self-proclaimed socialist approach. It was called the hermit state of Southeast Asia. And, you know, even in Myanmar, you know the you know the, the GDP you know per capita went from like 200 to over a thousand you know in the 20 years up to up to reform like it got substantially better off, and North Korea has just stayed outside of that move. It is it has retained its you know its socialist cluster. So it's socialist but not developmental socialist. So in the same way that the Philippines is not part of the book because it never pursued these sort of Japan like um, you know economic reforms, building a developmental state, North Korea is also exterior to it. So you would, if you want to understand North Korea, you could look, that weakness scenario is very much in play. Like, maybe the North Korean regime would collapse because it, you know, or it, it would democratize because it collapsed, you know, and, the, and the, the Kim family dynasty collapsed, or maybe it would happen that they look around and they say, you know what, we, you know, we actually think that we're pretty popular. We think that we could democratize, and it would be so. Either one would be at least, um, in principle, possible. But you, you studied North Korea more than more than me, so I, I defer to your, uh, to your, 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 your judgment. We probably have time for one or maybe two more. Hi. Um, so. I hate getting questions about hypotheticals, but I'm going to ask you a hypothetical because Malaysia... I won't ask you one then. <laughs> <laughs> Malaysia is on the list here, and yep. since your book was published, there's been another election. There's sort of this interesting coalitional government. Yep. I'd just like to hear you talk more about Malaysia since your book was published and kind of what you see there yeah. as a trajectory. Well, I love that question. That's not a hypothetical. That's just a great question. Um, well, so one thing about Malaysia I will say is one benefit of taking a long time with a book uh, is that it actually allowed us to get past the 2018 election. And because we're saying throughout, Malaysia, this is a regime that hit its apex in the mid-90s. They had a perfect opportunity to democratize through strength. The, the ruling party and coalition would have continued to thrive. I think, say this, I think without question, they missed their opportunity, and they eventually just lost power altogether. They get voted out. So again, it's a really important, you know, it's an important cautionary tale to authoritarian regimes that are resistant to reform. Like, if you're in a strong position, like, take advantage of your strength to reform. Um, and so in Malaysia, they do end up losing in 2018. Um, and I've written a piece recently that kind of looks at Malaysia and Indonesia together. So the thing about Malaysia and Indonesia is, like, during the... Um, 
during the Cold War, right, they, they kind of converged, right? They were both these sort of dominant authoritarian regimes, very stable, anti-communist, you know, anti-communalist, all this kind of thing. And then after the Cold War, after democratization, the last 25 years, they've really diverged, right? Indonesia became this democracy, Malaysia was not. Um, and what I argue is that they're actually converging again. Malaysia and Indonesia are becoming more similar again. And what they're both traveling is this pathway from authoritarian hegemony to sort of these, these, these kind of pluralistic, political pluralism, you know. And so it's kind of a mess of parties and there's fragmentation. And one feature of it is that in both cases, the old ruling party has found a way to finagle itself into a position of power, despite its decline in popularity. So Golkar in Indonesia, kept joining cabinets, it was even the biggest party in cabinets, even as its electoral support declined. And again, in Malaysia, even a place like Malaysia where UMNO seems so discredited, they have the deputy prime minister, they're the second most important party in government. Um, and so again, there's, even when, you, even when you wait too long, even when you do lose, there does tend to be life for these, you know, these, old, this, these old autocratic guards to a, to a large degree afterwards. So um, Malaysia's becoming kind of a, you know, it's uh, what, what Luke and Wei would call pluralism by default, in a way, right? It's sort of like, it's just kind of the, the, the center no longer holds. And I think it's a really interesting moment for you know, what's going to happen in Malaysia in terms of uh, polarization. I think the biggest thing in Malaysia right now of interest to me is that the, the opposition is entirely Islamist. The government is pluralistic. This is also somewhat true in Indonesia. Indonesia has managed that polarization pretty well. I don't know that Malaysia has the capacity to manage the, the kind of polarization it has right now when there's no dominant party in place to basically do it for everybody. Like it's gonna be, they're gonna have to invent new things in Malaysia essentially to, to, to get through this, so. But it's one o'clock, so we should stop. Do you wanna do some final words? Yeah, uh, uh, so interesting. I'll save my questions uh, for after we close. Uh, thank you for attending. We appreciate uh, the rich discussion. Uh, please join me once again in thanking Professor Slater. Thank you.